teachers, and welcome to another video lesson from our digital library. Today, we're going to talk about an exciting topic, traditional regular libraries. I'm sure you know what the library is, but today I'm going to surprise you with some interesting facts about amazing libraries around the world. Are you ready? Let's get started. In today's lesson, we're going to learn fun facts about some amazing libraries around the world. We are going to examine useful library-related vocabulary in relevant context, and we're going to go over some of the most confusing words in English. Now, who do you think is the author of this quote? Since I was a kid, libraries have played an important role in my life. Every book teaches me something new or helps me see things differently. I was lucky to have parents who encouraged me to read. Reading fuels a sense of curiosity about the world, which I think helped drive me forward in my career and in the work that I do now with my foundation. So, the 11th graders, who do you think is the author of this quote? I will help you a bit with the key vocabulary. To fuel means to give energy, to stimulate, to excite. So going to libraries was, in fact, a thing that helped this person achieve success. And I'm sure you know who this person is, and you have definitely uh, heard about his name many, many times. To drive someone forward is to push, to propel, to promote, and foundation. So this person created the foundation together with his wife. A foundation is an organization created to promote the public good. Any clues who that might be? Also, two more important pieces of information. Together with his wife, he created the Library Foundation. And from 1997 to 2018, the foundation invested $1 billion in public libraries, both domestically, which is in USA, and globally. So, my dear students, believe it or not, but that person is Bill Gates. Yes, Bill Gates is a big fan of libraries, and he invested a lot of money in making libraries more comfortable for you, for readers. And most importantly, in Republic of Moldova, we have the Novateka program, and we have a lot of libraries around Republic of Moldova that benefited from the funds offered by Bill Gates and his wife, Melinda Gates. In my view, investing in public libraries is an investment in the nation's future, said Bill Gates. I agree with him. How about you? Now, my question is, do people still go to libraries, or is it an old-fashioned activity? I'm sure many of you, when you hear about libraries, you're more like, mm, I have Google, I have the internet, why should I go to libraries? Well, believe it or not, but libraries are not old-fashioned. If you have a look at the images that I put on this slide, especially for you, you can see that libraries have changed over the time and they are hosted by amazing buildings and they have amazing technologies for you, for readers. Have a look at that library from Canada or United States, Egypt, UK, Czech Republic, Germany. All of them are so amazing. They can be traditional, they can be high tech, they can be modern, they can be cutting edge, which means very, very modern. So uh, believe it or not, going to libraries is not an old fashioned tradition. Let me give you more specific examples. In the picture, you can see an example of a modern library. The administration of the public library in Nice, France, is hidden inside the giant surrealist sculpture of a block head. Artist Sasha Sosna designed it to be the largest occupied sculpture in the world. The stretching sculpture is 28 meters high, containing seven floors. Yes, this is a real library inside of a real sculpture. Isn't that amazing? And if you want to see it, you need to travel to France. Another amazing library. This one is nicknamed The Eye and it's located in China. It features floor to ceiling, terraced bookshelves able to hold 1.2 million books and the large luminous sphere in the center that serves as an auditorium with a capacity of 110 people just in that giant sphere. This sphere, which appears like an iris, can be seen from the park outside through an eye-shaped opening. In the first week after opening day, approximately 10,000 people a day came to see that amazing building causing queues outside. Yes, believe it or not, but in China, people queue to get into that library. Wouldn't you be interested in visiting it one day? I would. 
Now, let's talk about some key vocabulary. Surrealist, just like the I, the library in China. It means literary and artistic movement of the 1900s that attempts to express the working of a subconscious and is characterized by fantastic imagery, just like the iris in the uh, library. Striking means attracting attention, fine, impressive, noticeable, sensational, spectacular, dramatic, Two features, so the library features the eye or the shape of an iris to represent, to appear, to spotlight, to depict an auditorium. So that there is an auditorium inside the library. It's a larger room to accommodate an audience in a building, such as school, theater. It's a room for public meetings or performances. So yes, in the middle of the library, there is an auditorium. So people are engaged in various activities. Now, let's talk about a different type of libraries. Of course, we would all be interested in visiting luxurious buildings, a modern, surrealist architecture. But how about basic, very simple libraries? In the picture, on this slide, you can see Biblio Bugo. Luis Arana was a Spanish teacher in rural La Gloria, Colombia. Concerned that his students had no access to books at home, he decided to do something about it. By adapting the back saddles of his two donkeys, Alpha and Beto, from carrying water to carrying books, we created a makeshift mobile library and set off to take his books to children who otherwise wouldn't have access to reading materials. And this is how Biblio Buro was born. Yes, my dear 11th graders, there is this amazing librarian who makes sure that children in remote areas still have access to books. And he uses his two... Um, donkeys alpha and beta to carry the books and make sure the children can access them. Let's have another uh, interesting example. In this picture, you can see the weapon of mass instruction. You're probably familiar with the concept of weapon of mass destruction. This one is instruction, so pay attention to the play of words. Argentine artist Paul Lamison turned a 1979 Ford Falcon, which is a real car, into a tank-like weapon of maths instruction. <laughs> He's driven the car all around the country to schools, slums, and rural areas, delivering free donated books to anyone who wants them. So the Argentinian car can carry up to 2,500 books. This is amazing. And Lamsoff also has built book cars in the United States and Holland. Isn't that amazing? A car that looks like a tank that brings the books to you. Now, let's have a look at the key vocabulary. So, pack saddle, we were talking about the Bublio Bingo. So, this is a saddle, the thing that you put on a horse or on a donkey, on which loads can be secured. So, you can carry anything on the backside of a donkey or a horse. It's a pack saddle. And makeshift means something that is temporary substitute for something, right? So, this Argentinian used his donkey and he created a makeshift pack saddle, which means they were adjusted for temporary carrying the books. Slum, so the tank, the weapon of mass instruction, carries books in slums. These are heavily populated urban areas characterized by substandard housing. Usually there are very, very poor people who live in slums. So it's a very good idea to have access to books when the library comes to you. And to set off, of course, means to begin to start a journey. Now, a few years ago, I had the amazing pleasure of visiting an unusual library located in North Carolina, United States. And the first thing that was surprising to me was that there were no librarians. We would go inside the building, there was a screen, and it was like a Google search, and we would search for the books we wanted to have to take, and then we had to go to the third floor, to the reception. By the time we got to the reception, a robot brought our book. Yes, I said a robot. So in this image, you can see an example of a book bot, which is another type of robot. The Hunt Library book bot, a robotic book delivering system, can store up to 2 million items in a climate control environment and deliver any of them within five minutes of a click in the online catalog, just like I explained. The book bot helps transform the 21st century library from a storage facility into a rich environment of learning and collaborative spaces. Books and other items are barcode, yes, like in a regular store, sorted by size and stored in over 18,000 bins, which are boxes. 
Each item is scanned when it is removed from or returned to the system, allowing the library's online catalog to track the location of all materials at all times. So this particular library doesn't need many librarians because it has the robot that scans the barcode of every book, takes it from the bin and brings it to you at the reception in just a few minutes. Isn't that amazing? Now, an accompanying virtual browse system allows users to see a virtual shelf of all items related in subject area, including the growing number of electronic books in the collection. The system is both fascinating to watch and easy to use. Within minutes of receiving the request, one of the book's bots, which is the robot, cranes retrieves the requested material and delivers it to an operator who sends it to us at the Ask Us Center or the reception, or to other library locations on campus via rapid delivery service. Yes, if you're a student and if you are on campus of that amazing library, there is a delivery service and you can electronically choose a book and then the service will bring it to you. Key vocabulary, so hold. Now, a library user may place a hold on a book charged out to another person. This ensures that the person placing the hold will be next in line to receive the book when the book is returned. Which means if you go to the library and you really want to read a book, but it's not available because another user has taken it, you place a hold on that book, which means when the person will return the book, you're going to be the first one in line to take it. Interlibrary loan. This is one of my favorites. When I was studying in the United States, I really wanted to read the most recent publications of certain books and my library did not have all of them, but they had access to interlibrary loan, which means my library from my university could uh, ask other libraries around the country, around the United States, if they had the book. And if they had it, they would send a copy to me. So lending and borrowing services, when a library user can borrow books, DVDs, music, or photocopies of documents that are owned by another library. Isn't that fantastic? Renewal, an extension of the loan period for library materials. Renewals may be handled in person at the circulation desk, by phone or by clicking on the library online catalog. So if you took a book, but you need more time to read it, you need to use this option, renewal. And circulation desk, a service desk where books and other materials are loaned or charged out to library users. Library materials which do not circulate can be used within the library. So sometimes if the books are rare, you can only use them inside the library. But if they have more copies of that book, you can take them. And in order to do that, you need to place a request at the circulation desk. So the key word is circulation, which means books come in and out. And not just books, but also DVDs, music, and other materials that are available in modern libraries. Reference assistant. These are not professional librarians, but they have been trained to help you with many of your research needs. Some reference departments hire reference assistants to help answer questions and provide general information about the library, which means you as a student can go into a library and ask for help. Where can I find information on this subject? And they will help you. Stacks. The stacks are the parts of the library which houses the physical collection. Books and periodicals are arranged on shelves in the stacks. So stacks include shelves and the books are on the shelves. This is pretty easy, I'm sure. Now, it's time to learn some reading-related idioms. Now, do you read me? So when you ask this question, you are in fact asking if people understand what you mean. It started in radio and telecommunication. For example, Bob, you read me? What is the situation from your position? So this is a question of whatever the receiver can hear or understand the transmission. But we use it to mean, do you understand me? I'm sick of all these useless conversations. Do you read me? Do you know what I mean? Read my lips. Listen closely to what I'm going to say because I'm going to be very clear. Come on, mom, can I please go out with my friends? Read my lips. No, I tell my children that many times. <laughs> so I know how to use this expression. My parents read me a lecture because I had neglected my chores. I didn't wash the dishes. I didn't take the trash out. I was read a lesson by my teacher last week for messing up my homework. That's what it means. It means that uh, someone, when someone reads a lesson or a lecture to you, it means that they scold you, right? It's to issue a reprimand or to scold. You did a bad thing. Know your friends. 
after so many adventures together, my best friend and I know uh, each other like a book. Let's ask Jeff. He knows the subject like a book. So if you know something like a book, it means that you know it completely or thoroughly and you understand it very well. You understand someone's emotions, motivations, or you understand how something works. What do you know like a book? Well, that's one for the books. I never thought he'd win the lottery, which means, wow, that's amazing. Wow, you finished a big box of cookies in less than two minutes. That's one for the books. <laughs> so this phrase is used to say that something is amazing, wonderful, impressive, surprising, or unexpected. Have you done anything recently? That's one for the books. All right, now the last activity for today that I included in this video lesson refers to some keywords related to libraries and reading. An open book, bookworm, hit the books. You can't judge a book by its cover and read my lips. Let's see if you can find the place of all these expressions in this context. Jean is very shy. She dresses conservatively and she keeps to herself most of the time at school. But I saw her out at a club this past weekend and she was really partying. It's true what they say. What do you think is the expression that should be included here? You can't judge a book by its cover. Next one. James has been since he was a young boy. He started reading at age five and has never been without a book since. So if someone is like that, then how do we describe them in English? He's a bookworm, of course. When I say you have to home to be home by 10 p.m., I mean it. If you can't follow the rules, you can't go out with your friends anymore. This is an example of read my lips. When I say you have to be home by 10, then I mean it. <laughs> it's time to get ready for our English final on Friday. So if you have a test or an exam, you should do what? hit the books, which means start studying. It's time to hit the books and get ready for our English final on Friday. I know Jill so well, she is like to me. I know when she's happy, sad or mad without her saying a word. So if you know someone else, she or he is like a an open book, which means you know everything about them. And the last thing is commonly confused phrases and words. Now, Many of you confuse fun and funny. Let's see what the difference is. Fun means something is enjoyable, right? That movie is really uh, fun to watch, for example, right? Funny, on the other hand, means that it's humorous, all right? So the movie is funny if you laugh, but the board game night was real fun, which means we had a good time. So funny is when you laugh and fun is just when you have good time. So there is a difference in meaning. The movie was funny because we laughed, but we had fun playing the board game, which means it was fun as an activity. So are your English lessons fun or funny? <laughs> so if you read at a joke, then the joke is funny. But if you're having a good time during your English lesson, then you say the English was fun. Used to and be used to. We used to go to the beach every summer, and I'm used to getting up early so it doesn't bother me. This question, by the way, is included in the TOEFL exam, so pay attention to this. Used to refers to a past action, all right? We used to go to the summer beach, right, every summer. It also means that we don't do it anymore. It's a past finished activity. We used to in the past, we're not doing it anymore. To be used to refers to something that you do repeatedly. It's a recurring situation, right? And something you get accustomed to. I'm used to getting up early means I do that very often and I do it regularly. And as you can see, there is a big difference between used to in the past and I am used to habitual repeated action in the present. Advice and advice. When do we spell it with C and when do we spell it with S? She took my advice and booked a flight to Prague and I advised her to buy this grammar book. So advice with C is a noun and advice with S is a verb. That is the difference. Sometimes this is confusing. Among and between. Among is used to express a loose relationship of several items. If you have a group, I found the pen hidden among papers on the desk, many papers. 
but if you only have two items, you can use between. I found a pen hidden between two sheets of paper on the desk. Two sheets, so between two people, we use between. If you have a group, many, you use among. Lose, lose. Again, confusing spelling, tricky spelling. Lose with double O is an adjective. This shirt is too loose on me, which means it's very large. To lose with S and one O is a verb. How did you lose your phone? So this is the difference. Adjective double O, one O is a verb. Lie and lay, a very confusing word, a very tricky word. Again, this one is included in the TOEFL exam. You lie down on the sofa. You lie down, like a reflexive, but you lay what the book on the table. So after lay, you need an object. You lay something on the table. You lay something on the book, all right? You lay, you put it some, somewhere. If you say lie, it, it lie, it doesn't need an object. You lie down, okay? That's it. No more um, objects after this verb. So this is the uh, difference. Lie does not require direct object. Lay, as a transitive verb, requires a direct object. My dear 11th graders, Albert Einstein once said, the only thing that you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. As I hope I proved it to you today, libraries are not old fashioned buildings and going to the library is not an outdated activity. There are so many amazing libraries around the world that you can visit and definitely you need to know where the library is located in your uh, city, village, uh, in your country, of course. So I hope that more of you will be encouraged to go to libraries, acquire more knowledge, develop more skills, and be better prepared for the future. Take care and see you for another video lesson in our digital library. Goodbye.